What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Spark to Fire. I'm your host, Landon Rhodes, and today I have Scott Ritzheimer with me. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Scott. Appreciate it, man. Landon, happy to be here. I'm excited. This is going to be fun. So Scott's specialty, um, among other things, is he really helps people identify not only when is the right time to hire a coach, which I think as an entrepreneur, a lot of us have gone through like, man, I, you know, I I've hit this certain wall. Um, wh what happens after that point? And he also helps people get, uh, connected with the right coach. And so he's got this company scale architects, basically helping businesses across the country, identify the right growth strategies and find the right guides to help them get on the fast track to predictable success and stay there as long as possible. Um, I want you to just kind of share with us a little bit about your journey and then tell us a little bit about scale art architects and eight figure focus. Yeah. I, uh, you know, like some people, you know, some people feel like they're destined to be an entrepreneur. Some of us like myself kind of stumble into it. Uh, and at the right old age of 20, I had the opportunity of helping refound, uh, which is also kind of weird, but refound a company that had been started a few years earlier uh, sold uh, in an owner finance deal, uh, systematically but unintentionally destroyed, and then uh, and then re basically repurposed after that. So in that whole mix, somehow I got in there and ended up uh, being one of the ones to refound the organization. Uh, now, uh, one thing that's helpful to know is this is August of two thousand and eight which if you remember was not a great time to be starting a business, especially one that had a, a couple hundred thousand dollars of debt and several hundred angry customers uh, that came with the, that came with it. But um, so just kind of fell into it. And when you have all of that going on, it's just like you hit the ground running, you, you work the problem, whatever it is. So we we're working out of my partner's basement, uh, you know, having the HOA come knocking on our door every day. And, you know, just the whole, the whole thing uh, was, it was bizarre. We, uh, we had, we had someone one day um, uh, knock out our whole network because all of our network wires were like run on the floor and she just like tapped one of them with her foot underneath. And it's just like, that's how we ran things. I mean, it was just, it was just bizarre and crazy and weird. And, and, you know, at the time I thought it was just us. And now that I have an opportunity to work with founders all over the place, it's, that's just entrepreneurism. Like that's, it's not the glamorous thing that we see on TV or, or on Forbes, but it's just the, the ragtag bunch of people who, who honestly, most days don't know any better, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and go for it. So we did that. Um, and, uh, you know, while the world was on fire, I mean, stocks dropped, I think, somewhere around 40% during the first six months that we were back in business. And uh, during that time, we grew like crazy. And for years, actually, we had double digit growth. We were in, um, we never registered for it, but we were in uh, the Fortune uh, 500 fastest growing companies. If you had taken our, our growth rate, it was just a phenomenal run. Uh, doing it in a really fun, rewarding space. We we're helping start churches, actually. Uh, and so we we're awesome. sitting in this kind of tension between the nonprofit world and the for profit world, uh, the space between kind of mission and action, right? Like, uh, yeah. you know, on profit and cause and and so it was just this, this excellent opportunity during my time there, um, in just over a decade, we, we helped start over 20,000 organizations, uh, oh many gosh. of them churches, some of them businesses, uh, other types of nonprofits. And when you have an opportunity to see entrepreneurism at scale like that, because in a for-profit world, nonprofit world, the folks who are starting these organizations, are, they're cut from the same cloth. You know, they use different language, they have different goals and aspirations, but uh, they're, they're following a very, very similar path. And uh, just watching that, experiencing it at such a young age has, has just been an opportunity to see at scale how this thing works. You know, it, it was in many ways, it felt like we were the only ones going through something. And in other ways, it felt like, hey, this is what all of us do every day. Uh, and so it's just a, a neat process. Um, but again, one that I just kind of fumbled into, like, I, I didn't know anything about starting churches. I, and we were doing a, a lot of work with the IRS and, and tax code and things like that. I didn't know anything about that either. And it was just like, you learn it as you go, you know, it's what you do. And, and so uh, you just had an opportunity to do that, uh, became CEO of that organization, ran the company for five years. Uh, we hit $10 million uh, in annual revenues, which was a big milestone for us. And uh, about that time, you know, after, 
uh, some some interesting things that happened before that. But about that time, I recognized that my time as CEO of that organization was coming to a close, and and really had to start thinking what are, what am I going to do next? You know, what am I going to set my sights on? And, and uh, for reasons that I think we'll probably jump into here a little bit later, uh, I decided that I was going to go into the the consulting space. Uh, I I had run that organization alone for a very long time. I knew how painful that was and unnecessary. Right. And I wanted to be able to help people skip past a, a significant number of the challenges that I faced uh, as a leader trying to do it and figure it out on my own. What was the functionality of how you helped those business owners? Like, what was the kind of channel you were helping them through? We did uh, what we called the least sexy side of starting an organization. So we did a lot of the registration paperwork. Uh, we would work through things like bylaws, uh, the mm. early, early organizational structures. Uh, we did it through several mediums. We would do uh, teaching events uh, all across the country. Uh, we had services where we'd go through and do a lot of the paperwork for the organization. Uh, it's a little bit like... Um, Legal Zoom, if you will, uh, but yeah, a full a full service thing. Yeah, this is similar to that. Um, there's some obvious differences, but yeah, that's that's the easiest kind of peg to put it on. And then we right. also had some software that helped folks do it uh, on their own. Very cool. Gotcha. Okay, so you get out of that world. You're a CEO of a ten million dollar plus company, and you you know that time is really coming to an end there. What's next? So what's next? So during that time, uh, as I'm leading it, um, we we have this run, like I mentioned earlier, of just like unadulterated success, right? It's just like goes mm -hmm. uh, double digit growth every single year. If we're like we're looking at our growth plan, it's like hire another sales rep, you know, do a couple more events. Like that was it. It was relatively simple to grow. Uh, it was hard, you know, as breathless sprint across the finish line every single week, but. We just had this extended run where it was, for all intents and purposes, easy. And then uh, slowly but surely, we, we started having challenges that were mostly inside the organization. Um, and the, the clearest kind of sign of all of it, and there was a lot that led up to this, but we were keeping less and less of the revenue that we were making each year. So revenue still going up uh, by that time, about a, a million, a little more than a million dollars a year. And, and that's wonderful. And we'd celebrate all these sales. And then we're looking at the, you know, our tax return at the end of the year. And it's like, wait a second, what happened? Like, we're, we're not mm -hmm. keeping really any more of this than, than before. And, uh, and that happened, that kept happening year after year, that percentage profit was going down and, and we couldn't figure it out. It's like, we're, we're, you know, we're not having the, the like existential crises that we were before. Like we have plenty of money to, uh, to make things work. We have plenty of sales reps. We have all of these things should be working. Why are we keeping less and less of it? We didn't have a bunch of people that weren't working hard. You know what I mean? Like we had heavily invested, uh, in, in training up staff for efficiencies. And, mm. uh, and so, We'd done all the things that we knew to do. Uh, we had read books like Traction and Patrick Lencioni's work and mm -hmm. uh, Good to Gray. Like we had, and we had done these things, but for some reason we're hitting this wall that we just can't get through. So several years of this go by and it's really, really challenging. You know, when things are good, you know, things like partnerships are really easy. When things are challenging, you know, partnerships are really tough. So my partner and I are having some, you know, just not seeing things the same way. Uh, there's division on the leadership team. We've got some people that are coming and going through the organization, lost a couple of key leaders, uh, a couple of other key leaders just aren't hanging in there. And we can't figure it out. You know, it's like what happened, you know, to, to these times where, you know, we just had a sales rep and everything moved forward. Right. <laughs> and so I was just kind of banging our head against the wall for a while. Even tried to hire in a couple of consultants uh, that actually made things worse, not better, but um, you know, just felt completely alone in it. It's like, if we can't figure it out, it's not in any of these books. None of these consultants can help. What in the world are we going to do? And so one day I'm listening to a podcast like this, actually, and uh, a gentleman comes on the, the podcast and he starts talking about these seven stages that businesses go through in something he calls the predictable success model. And so he's talking about these early stages. There's early struggle. There's fun. It's like, oh, I remember that. I remember that, you know, and then he starts talking about this stage called whitewater. And I'm like, holy crap. Wait a second. Like, that's, that's where we are. <laughs> What is going on here? And and predictable so he just success kinda, is the book. Yeah, right? predictable success is the book. I, and so, so that's cr so crazy, dude. It's literally 
It's sitting right up there. I haven't read it yet. Oh, my, come uh, on. my my good friend Paul recommended it to me, but I there will you go. Absolutely. Now you're in. Now. Yeah, now you're in. So it, phenomenal book. So uh, so I hear he kind of breezes through it and he talks about something and then he talks about predictable success, which is the next stage. And I'm like, yes, I want that. And how do I get it? So they tell you where to find the book. I go, I probably got it on Amazon or something, but I got the audio book. And uh, this is somewhere in the mid, it's like 2014. Uh, and so 2014, um, uh, you know, I have the audio book and my wife is from Norway. And so each year she, before we got married, she's like, you know, by marrying me, you're committing to flying me to Norway every year. Like that's just, it comes with the territory. So yep. we, uh, we did that we, and I got her out there every year, even when we made like no money at all, somehow we made it work. And, and then we had kids and it got really expensive. Uh, and so we realized, okay, this is vacation too. So we've got to find a way of making the most of it. And so we'd pawn the, the kids off on my in-laws uh, in Norway, <laughs> and then we'd find cheap tickets to wherever we could get to in, uh, in Europe. And so uh, it just so happens that this one time we're out there, I was probably in May or something like that. And uh, it lines up with the Formula One race in Monaco, which like if you're a car person or like Formula One, it's like the pinnacle of, of at least European motorsport. And so you've got these cars going 113 miles an hour through streets as wide as your driveway, you know, uh, and it's just a remarkable thing to see and past billion dollar yachts along the way. It's like right against the Mediterranean coast and the, you know, not French Riviera, but the, you know, in Monaco, right by the French Riviera. And it's just this gorgeous, romantic trip that my wife and I are going to go on. And so what am I doing uh, on the plane ride across France to this wonderful romantic uh, journey? I'm listening to uh, some, you know, British guy talk about business life cycle stages in an audio book. And uh, again, just kind of progressing through these earlier stages, and he gets to the, the chapter where he starts talking about this whitewater stage again. And I mean, it just hits me like a ton of bricks. It's like, you wonder, it's like, has he been reading my email? You know, has he like, <laughs> you yeah. know, has, does he have a camera in my office? Because this is exactly right. what's happening. And it's this moment. And now using the model, I get to see this happen all the time. But it's that you are here moment. It's like the old days of being in a mall, you know, when you're a kid mm -hmm. and looking at the map and, <laughs> and you're like, I have no idea where I am. And you find one of those maps and it's like, you are here. It's like, oh, good. Okay. I'm on the map. You know, I'm, I'm not completely yeah. lost. It was one of those you are here moments and just the relief from knowing that we hadn't gone off the reservation. Uh, we the business wasn't about to die. You know, it's just a normal stage that successful organizations go through is wonderful. What was even weirder than the fact that I'm doing this, you know, when I should be just enjoying myself, uh, was that the very next thought that went through my mind, uh, and remember I'm helping, you know, start churches at the time. Uh, the very next thought that goes through my mind is, if I could help other business leaders get out of whitewater for the rest of my life, I'd die a happy man. Hmm. And that's not, that's not really a normal thought for people when they read about yeah. whitewater, they're like, I want out of this. I want nothing to do with it. Give me, you know, anything else, fun, predictable success. I don't care what it is. Just get me out of here. And, and that was really the seeds of the very first time that I recognized kind of my own entrepreneurial journey, my own calling, the, the spark to fire moment, if you will, uh, for the podcast. And, um, and then I did what most people do when they read or listen to books. I did absolutely nothing for three years. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I'm never going to talk about it ever again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I, I get distracted by fast cars and, and I, we come home from vacation and it's just back to business as usual. And it's painful, painful, painful business as usual. And about three years go by. And I finally remember, I was like, wait a second, what about that book? You know, it described where we were and so I go to the book and in the back, there's just kind of this simple how-to guide, right? If you're here, you want to get to here, here's what you need to do. Uh, certain steps in order, and that's what you need to do. And so I, uh, I did the poor man's implementation. We've been in Whitewater for quite a while, so we didn't have the, uh, the money to hire a consultant by this point. But um, go out and you know, print out the back of the book and take it to my team and say, this is what we're going to do. Like, we're going to figure it out. And we did. And within about... Um, uh, about 13 months, so just over a year, we added a million dollars to our bottom line, not our top line, our bottom line. Wow. And we did that by cutting a million dollars off of our top line. 
And it's just something that we would have had no grid for if we didn't recognize the steps that you need to take to get out of white water. And, and, uh, and it was just remarkable. I mean, you have some, a transformation like that after we'd looked and tried and done everything that we can think of to have something that remarkable happen that fast. Can, can you describe really did it. whitewater for, for the listeners that haven't read? So, yeah. Success? So what is whitewater? So we'll kind of take a step back because the earlier stages help set the stage for whitewater and what's happening. Mm-hmm. So the very beginning, everyone kind of gets that starting a new business should be hard, right? And that's why the very first stage is early struggle. It's this fight to get the thing off the ground. And it's hard. Uh, it, it's like waking up every day and kind of banging your head on a sharp object. You know, it's we all smile. <laughs> you know, it's like the entrepreneur entrepreneur smile, like, it's great. Uh, how, you know, it's wonderful. And then you turn around and you're like, I don't know if we're going to survive tomorrow. Uh, and so that's what early struggles like. It's just this fight for survival. It's existential. And what happens is if you do the right things, you bring in the right people uh, and you, you have the right focus. Uh, and we even talked about this beforehand. You can go do a thousand things or you can do really, you be really good at one of them. And, uh, and that's really the journey that most of us fall is saying yes to too many things and then finding out what we can actually do. But once you do that, you start to develop momentum. You know, it's kind of like mm-hmm. that rocket, you know, the rocket fires, you know, it's on the platform, you know, one of the big Tesla rockets or whatever. And, and there's all this smoke and energy that happens, but it never actually gets off the ground. And then mm-hmm. after that, that it's a brief pause, but a, a, an enormous amount of energy is expended this time. It's about 90% of the rocket's fuel goes out in this stage. After that, you see it start to budge. And that's what that next stage is like. You, you enter into this second stage that we call fun and, and it, it's subtle at first, right? You, the very first thing that happens is you actually make payroll for the first time. Uh, and then, you know, then all of a sudden you start, you start seeing like, we're in the black, like we're, we're actually, we're making yeah. profit now. <laughs> and then it's like the rocket takes off, right? All of that work and that latent energy that was stored up in that early struggle period when we were trying to do whatever we could come up with, we do enough of that, we hustle enough and we hit this fun period that that's awesome. You know, it's, that's where we were in earlier is that double digit growth. You'll see organizations hit double, triple, quadruple digit growth. Now there's two reasons for that. One is because they're growing. The other one is, you know, they're starting with a really small denominator. You know, the beginning of fun, your your market share is about 2% of the square root of squat. You know, it's, it's, it's not a whole lot to improve on. You go from one customer to two and you've doubled, you know, so yeah. So, you know, you know, in a sense, it's not all that crazy, but for, for folks that are in it, it's everything, you know, and it's, it's a breathless sprint across the finish line. You end the day righteously exhausted, but you're winning. And, and that's where you can live for quite a while, right? You can run that for quite a while, but what's happening during that time, right? You're growing. And what happens when you grow is the organization starts getting more and more complicated, uh, you, you go from having one employee to 20, 30, 40, 50, you know, we're up to 75. Uh, if you start with having a handful of customers and now you've got 300 that you're working at any given point in time, you, you start the day with two products and now you've got 20. And across virtually every single metric, complexity is rising. And that doesn't matter for a while because you can just keep going. You just keep adding and and it feels like everything you touch turns to gold. But at some point, it varies by industry. It varies even by leadership style. It varies by by the, the nature of the team. But at some point, that complexity builds up and causes you to cause problems. And, and one of the clearest signs uh, is, again, like it was for our business, where profit starts to separate from revenue. Back mm-hmm. in that fun stage, you can just sell your way out of just about any problem, right? <laughs> and, and because it's relatively simple enough, if you grow the top line, the, follow, the bottom line follows suit. Once you hit whitewater and that complexity builds up, you start messing up your hiring a little bit, right? You start having disagreements at the leadership level. Uh, you start dropping the ball on customer engagements where you used to be able to make promises that you had no business promising, right? Uh, and right. somehow making them happen. You keep making those promises and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden it's one promise too many, right? And it's kind of like, have you ever seen the variety show where they're like spinning plates on bamboo yeah. sticks? Yeah. It's like that. So you're spinning more and more and more and more. What happens when the first one breaks? They, they all, break. all come down, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what whitewater feels like. It, it's it, It's one of those things that 
you know, it looks a little different in different environments, but it's something that everyone feels. You know, I had a, a CEO come to me recently and he said, you know, up until six months ago, my leadership team was just unbelievable, like off the charts. We could do anything we wanted to do. And then we just got dumb right? Like something happened, yeah. same group of people doing the same thing. And we can't get anything right for, to save our souls. Like, what is that? You know, it's uh, another one said, uh, I, I used to have a great feel for the organization. I knew mm. when it was time to push. I knew when it was time to, to lay back a little bit. I knew when we could make it happen. Yeah. And now I feel like I'm running the organization with oven mitts on. You know, it's, it's just, it, I, you just can't touch it anymore. Someone else, uh, said, uh, I was uh, talking with someone else who was asking me to come in. I said, tell me about your levers for growth, right? How do you, if you want to grow, what do you do? And he said, I, I used to be able to answer that question. Now I have no idea. Mm. That's what white water looks like. This is what it feels like. And, uh, and it's where we're systematically dropping the ball. And because we're systematically dropping the ball, that's why revenue plummets. It's not kind of this mysterious thing. It's, it's that we don't have the systems and processes either at the front line or even more importantly in our decision making to, to really handle the complexity of the organization that we've built. And because of that, it just creates all of this internal turmoil and, and basically a lack of performance across what was otherwise an, an immensely successful organization. Mm. Fascinating. So what, what has been your experience of when you see people that are in white water and you've seen a lot of them with, uh, with your firm where you're helping them out of this, what, if you could describe this other than just like, okay, profits are down, how else would you describe that moment for that entrepreneur? What are they going through specifically? Yeah, well, a lot of times what happens that that isn't the cause of whitewater, but is a symptom of it, is that they lose a really great leader. Uh, and so a, a story there is uh, I was working with, it was actually a couple of uh, owners that were working together, John and Rachel, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was speaking at a group of CEOs that he was part of, and I was talking about these different stages. And before I started speaking, everyone was just kind of talking and he was the loudest guy in the room, you know, talking about, he was in marketing, he was talking about all these great strategies that he'd come up with. And, and you would think that the guy was just crushing it based on the way that he was talking. Right. Well, as I start describing these stages and describing early struggles, describing fun, he's kind of sitting there, he's straight across the table from me uh, and he's smiling. And I start talking about whitewater and his face just goes pale. And, and like, I'm like, he's like visibly something's wrong. And I start getting a little concerned for the guy, but I'm like, I just gotta, you know, the show's gotta go on. I don't know. Something's going to yeah. happen. And, and uh, we stop for a break and he doesn't move. And after a couple of minutes, he comes up to me and he's like, that's it we're in whitewater. We just had our main uh, person, they were using uh, another model. Uh, and there's a, there's a key individual, right? The leader sits right in the middle of it all. And she just came to us last week and said, uh, I, I can't do this. Um, I'm out. You know, it's something that they were, they had, they had really put all of their eggs in that basket. Like, Hey, we can't lead this alone. We need to bring someone else in to help lead this. Mm -hmm. They bring her in, give her the responsibility and she just crumbles. And he said, if we don't fix this, it's over, right? If, if we don't fix this, it's not worth it, right? Now, he's a multi-million dollar organization at the time, but he was just mm -hmm. crushed under the weight of having to carry it all forward. Just spoke with a, a, another group uh, that we're just starting working with, and uh, it's two brothers. Uh, and uh, I don't know why we've got related people coming out in these stories, but that's just how it's, it's working. So uh, it's not always uh, siblings, but uh, there's usually multiple people in this leadership circle. Um, mm -hmm. And and so they come and they say, hey, we're just tired. Like things are good. It's not that they're all that bad, but it's like, we feel like we have to be on 100% on our game every single moment. And if we don't do it, it's not going to happen. And they're like, we have great leaders, we've got a good team, but if we go away for a week, the thing stalls, you know, it, it just yeah. can't sustain itself. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they're, I think about a $5 million organization. So it's not like they're by themselves, but they feel like right. they're by themselves. And that's one of the, the biggest things about it. And it's one of the things that breaks my heart the most. It's what I experienced and what I see happening again and again is the biggest effect for uh, the founder or the leaders themselves is that they feel isolated. They feel like they're all alone in it. 
And that's why that moment of you are here, like you're on a map is so powerful and so transformative for folks is even if I don't tell them the way out, just that they know that they're on the map, they've now got a chance of finding their way out. And, uh, and so it's, it's really crushing uh, for, for many, there's oftentimes a loss of control right? Uh, the, the levers aren't working anymore. There's a sense of discouragement. Uh, I don't know that I'm the one to lead this organization forward. Mm, I tough. talk with a, a lot and they're, they're thinking about hiring a professional CEO. They think that's going to solve the problem. Uh, and unfortunately, it does not. It, it's not a question of a professional CEO or not. It's a, a question of whether or not you can tackle the challenges of whitewater. Mm, man, that's, that's so fascinating because I think I think the people that are at the 500,000 to the million dollar level ask the question of like, Oh, you know, maybe I'll just have these problems when I'm, I'm, you know, where I'm at right now. But then you hear somebody at the 5 million and the 10 million and the $20 million level from a revenue standpoint is also having those issues. I think it starts to be, it starts to, to really set in. And so how much of white water is a derivative of revenue? You can't get there if you don't win in fun. And you can't win in fun if you don't have revenue, right? So whitewater is not, it's actually not something that happens because you do something wrong. It's actually something that happens because you do something right. Those who succeed the most in fun feel the effects of whitewater the greatest. Fascinating. I have be, to read this book. I'm, because, I'm so pumped to read this book. Because the be way that you lead through Whitewater is in mm. many ways the opposite of how you got there, right? Uh, the way that yeah. you lead out of it, right, is it, it's oftentimes for the people who are leading there feels like to do the exact opposite of what their intuition tells them. And so because of that, it's really, really hard. If you've succeeded in fun, you typically do that by what? Having a great idea, executing on that exceptionally well, and doing that again and again and again. Again Don't need to overthink it. Don't need to overthink it. having good ideas. Yeah, just go, right? And and (laughs) so when we get to Whitewater, and now all of a sudden we're talking about systematizing things and processing things, and you start trying to bring in leaders who think in terms of systems and process into what is largely the Wild West, right, of, of the way yeah. that you lead your organization. Uh, it, it It's like, you know, it feels like you're slamming on the brakes on an organization that's not even moving, right? That's what it feels like for most folks going in. And so it actually feels like you're doing the very opposite of what you should be doing. And if you don't, If you don't have anyone there who can tell you that is the way, you're never going to do it that way, right? You're going to go back to what you know. You're going to find a way of simplifying and selling through. And you can do that. That works for a little while, but eventually and inevitably, you're going to have to overcome the challenges of whitewater. You can't just avoid them. So what happened to you then? You were in in Morocco. You read this book. You're sitting there probably freaking out at this point being like, well, like you feel better, right? Because you know where you are. And so you go back and you tell your team and what happens after that? So again, uh, I do what most of us do when we read a book. I do nothing oh, yeah. for, th- for three years, right? So that, that's, I, okay, I wish sorry, I could that's say, where we are. That's where I we wish are. I could, story, yeah, so I wish I could come point. in you know, knight in shining yeah. armor and say, I went and fixed everything right away. Uh, it didn't work that way. I, I did absolutely nothing about it. And, and the moral of that story is whitewater does not fix itself right? It, it does not fix itself. You cannot wait it out. You cannot sell your way out of it. You can't muscle your way through it. There's a very specific way and you have to adopt that way, or you have to ease off the gas and slow down. So mm. after learning that the very hard way, you know, profit goes all the way down from, uh, we were sitting in the mid twenties and thirties for quite a while as a profit margin. And we dropped all the way down to 7% one year. Wow. And, uh, and it was, it was bad. Like it was like heads are going to roll kind of bad, you know, it's like, we're so profitable, but that's just not enough to, to be sustainable not, at that point. Not a good place to be. Yeah. So, uh, so that is when that was really the impetus behind, okay, we've got to make this happen. What are we going to do? Went to the book, followed these five steps in the book and just a dramatic turnaround. We tripled our bottom line, uh, in the first year and then nearly doubled it again in the next year. And it was just off to the races. We, we found our way through whitewater and today the organization's in predictable success, even through all of the COVID realities that have happened, they've grown by double digits. It's just fantastic. Wow. Um, 
and so organization got into predictable success and it was wonderful. And, and I realized uh, in a, a slightly masochistic way that I'm not carved out for predictable success. I, I actually like, now that I understand it, I recognize that my strengths as a leader, uh, the way that I think, the way I'm wired are, is actually custom fit to Whitewater. Um, and so that, you know, that kind of second revelation of, you know, if I could help people out of Whitewater, I'd die a happy man. Uh, that became a reality. I, I transitioned over to the next generation of leadership of the company went exceptionally well. Uh, I sold my shares to the existing ownership group and, um, and jumped out uh, as a consultant and then realized I knew nothing about consulting. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. so, uh, so shortly after that, uh, I had an opportunity to actually work with the author of the book, Predictable Success. His name is Les McEwen. And mm -hmm. uh, he brought me really into the fold, trained me on how to use his, his model and, and really took me deep into the inner workings of that system. And after a, a couple of years of working like that, helping organizations achieve those same outrageous results that we did uh, as a company, uh, I had the opportunity, he invited me in and said, hey, I'd love for you to help me teach other coaches to do this, right? And, uh, and so that's what I have the opportunity to do now. I, it's kind of twofold. Uh, I really sit at the intersection between founders and coaches. I, I help mm -hmm. founders find the right coach for the right stage. Uh, and I also help coaches to, to really embrace the structured approach that we found is the best way of helping uh, organizations, particularly through that whitewater and a later stage called treadmill. Fascinating. I love that. Yeah. I was actually looking at your website just a, a few minutes ago and, and just skimming over this. And I didn't, that's so cool that you've been working with, you know, like it just, and for you guys, uh, just for the listeners of Spark to Fire, I'd like to just read off some of these uh, testimonials from Predictable Success and Scale Architects. Uh, you have the president and CEO of Ford Motor Company, um, <laughs> a couple other people. Uh, yeah, I mean, Les McEwen, or excuse me, did I say that right? How, how yeah. do you see his last name? Yeah, McEwen. McEwen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is so cool. And I'll have to tell my buddy who recommended me the book that, um, that you guys work directly with him. And, um, I think, I think that's super special that you guys are actually helping businesses out of that because, um, a lot of what my friends told me when I got into business was, and my buddy, Eric, who, uh, is also been a guest in the show has said like, bro, I don't know how to, I don't know how to break this to you, but just bad things are going to happen to you at a million bucks in revenue. And I don't, I don't know how to tell you when or what's going to happen, but you're just like, bad things are going to happen to you. And yeah, like he was right. And so I'm, I'm very interested to go back and, and read this now and understand like, okay, are we in white water? Were we in white water? Are we on our way out? Um, it's fascinating. Yeah. I, it, it, it very, it's very fascinating to me. Yeah. So somebody's in it, <clears throat> somebody's inside of white water what is like one of the number one strategies that you guys, uh, you know, suggest that they do to get out of it? I need you to not fall asleep when I say this. You promise? Uh -huh, I promise. Okay. Uh, it's, it's high quality team-based decision-making. Most boring phrase in the world, uh, but it is the number one transformational tool that you need to implement. What, what gets you through those early stages is kind of what I call magic eight ball decision making. It's that golden mm -hmm. gut of the founder where you, you just intuitively know the right thing, right? The, I'll have founders say like, I can just smell what's going to be profitable or, or I, I just know what's going to work, right? That phrase, I just know pops up all over the place. Yeah. And what's happening is as founders, we've got our hands in everything, right? We are the centerpiece of the hub and spoke model, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and so all things pass through us and then go out again. And because of that, we can kind of keep tabs on what everything's doing. And internally, we synthesize that into our decision making. Uh, it's not nearly as mystical as it seems. It's, it's actually highly pragmatic. And it's 100% the way to do it early on. Because if you try to lead an organization out of early struggle by committee, it's not going to happen right? Mm -hmm. we, we bump into that all the time in the nonprofit world. You want to have everyone voting on every decision from the very beginning, you'll never get the momentum that you need to move forward. And so uh, early yeah. on, it's that golden gut, you know, it's that, that you shake the magic eight ball and, and you know, internally, and, and you know, <laughs> surely you will succeed. It's like, you go, you know, uh, and, right. and, and that's how we do it. 
you can't get through Whitewater on your own because the organization is too big and too complex for any one person. It's not you. It's not a professional CEO. There's no one person who can assimilate the amount of information that you need to consistently make high quality decisions. And because of that, really all of it is around this idea of building high quality team-based decision-making first at the top of the organization, right? Building a genuine senior leadership team, which we typically have a set of leaders, but in the best sense of the word, they're enablers, right? They are there to execute and run the plays of the senior leader, the, the founder, CEO, whatever, most senior, most senior executive. Mm-hmm. When you get to Whitewater, you need to assemble a team of leaders that in and of their own right, right? Not enablers, but folks who, who come with their own vantage point. And then you need to learn to synthesize all those various vantage points together. And once you've done that at the leadership team level, then you start doing it oftentimes at a middle management level and then throughout the entire organization. And again, moving to that kind of structured approach for decision-making as a team is antithetical to the way that we've led so far. It's been all hands on deck all the time, right? Do the right thing, make a decision in the moment, right? We have one person making this decision, one person making that decision, and and that's what works early on, but we now have to move to the structured approach. So what we're going for, particularly in Whitewater, is building the muscle of high quality team-based decision-making throughout the entire organization. And you do that through a series of really, really practical and oftentimes really, really boring things like the org chart uh, or mapping out information flow or uh, you know, how you set up agendas and operate leadership team meetings. Uh, it's, it's nuts and bolts mechanical stuff, but it's things that you need to do to improve the quality of the decisions you're making as an organization because it's the only way to overcome complexity. Love that. It's a great... It's a great line right there. Uh, if you guys, if you guys are uh, listening to this in your car, I think you should take a second or on the treadmill, take a second and think about that. Uh, the quality of your decisions is going to determine how your life ends out, and that's and, and we knew that. You know, we've been told that as kids, we've been told that um, you know that your life is a sum of the decisions you make, but you don't think about it from a leadership and an organizational level. You just think, well, if I make good decisions and they're automatically going to cascade downward. And while there's a certain percentage of them that absolutely do, what you're basically saying, if I understand you right, is that you have to, to make time and make effort specifically for teaching the organization to make better decisions. And you have to still make great decisions as an individual. That's right. And what we often do, especially around this time is, is, We know decision-making is important, but we measure it the wrong way. Uh, Back in early struggle and fun, the success of our decisions was largely a function of their speed and quantity. How quickly can we make enough decisions to get through this, right? And so, you know, uh, Dave Ramsey says, if I don't like a decision, I'll change it. You know, that's, that's the approach in those early days. And so what happens is when we get to whitewater, we actually double down on that mentality. We need to make faster decisions. We need to you know, make more decisions. And, and what ends up happening is we get stuck in this firefighting loop where we're making decisions and then trying to execute on them. But we're making decisions so quickly, we can't fully execute on them. So we get them to where they're at least half-baked if if that, and then move on to the next thing. And then we have to go back and fix the previous thing. And so we end up just in this cycle, instead of finishing things, we're just going back in and fixing and fixing and fixing. And so we can't pride ourselves on speed of decision, right? We have to pride ourselves on the quality of decision, which is measured by the speed of execution. That's the big difference. If you're measuring your effectiveness as a leadership team by the speed at which you make decisions, you're going to get stuck in whitewater for a very long time. If you measure your effectiveness by the speed of execution, you will find yourself getting out of whitewater very quickly. But that actually means slowing down your decision making, which is just agonizing at first. But when you recognize that by slowing down those decisions, you actually create the space to improve prove execution that's where you see the the payoff really start to come through fascinating so give me an example of that like 
Give me a nuts and bolts example of what you just said. So where it tends to pop up, one of the areas, and, and this is something that we tend to work on the very first time, is as the organization grows, it's actually an accumulation of past decisions, right? So we've got um, Jim doing this, we've got Jess doing that, we've got Jeremiah doing this other thing. And, and at one point in time, it was the leader, right? It was you and me, and, and we were doing it, and we knew why we were doing it, and we could decide if we wanted to do it or not do it anymore. Yeah. Well, once we hand it off, what do we hand off? We hand off the ability to continue executing that idea. No but process. what we don't hand off is the context for which that that task was that was made. And so once it goes into their hands as leaders, we think it's done. For them, they think it's the golden rule, right? They must do what we told them to do because the leader said so. And so you'll get someone five years later doing the exact same thing you told them to do five years ago. When we were using a completely different software system, working for a completely different set of clients and had half the number of staff that we have today. And so one of the areas that this comes up is someone comes and says, hey, should we do this? And your instant thing is, how fast can I get it to a yes or no decision? But what you're not doing is you're not giving them the context for making that decision. So someone comes and uh, let's say it's a, a, a classic example is um, challenges between sales and fulfillment. So mm -hmm. your sales reps are coming, they're responsible for putting invoices together. They go over to fulfillment and, uh, you know, billings processing along the way. In Whitewater, we tend to start screwing that up because there's a level of complexity there that has to be overcome, right? We've got to make sure it gets to the right person. And so leadership team realizes, okay, sales team is selling things, but they're not marking the invoices correctly. And so they're getting over to billing, they're processing what the invoice says, but there's holes that they're having to fill in and it's not actually the right stuff in the first place. Right. And so what do we do? We come in and we say, okay, sales team needs to do everything correctly. If, if they send you anything that's wrong at all, send it right back, right? Decision made, done, problem solved. But is the problem solved, right? So sales team sends over an invoice and it's got yesterday's date, but everything else is correct. Should that really go back to the sales rep and keep them off the phone so that they can look up what the date was supposed to be and correct the date and send it over, right? Uh, it's just we, need to go out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what if, what if it came from the sales manager, right? And not the sales rep themselves? Who does the person in billing send it back to? You know, how does the person in billing even measure whether or not it's done correctly in the first place? And so we we pride ourselves as a leadership team because like decision done, solved. We kept those pesky sales reps in place, you know, but the reality of it is you've not actually solved anything. You've just moved a problem a little bit and you've created this contentious environment where uh, I had a, a lady who was in billing once and she had the, the she was responsible for this kind of a transaction. And when she went in the sales room, she had a nickname, the Grim Reaper. Right. Like <laughs> that's not how you get out of whitewater, right. By right. having your billing person who's responsible for, for signing everyone's checks uh, as well called the grim reaper. And so that's an example of God. we've not slowed down to really assess what's going on here oh, and create something that's actually going to overcome that complexity. So yeah, quick decision. Great. You know, vetted out justice. Wonderful. Now you got a grim reaper that an entire team hates and you're trying to get people to work together who, who just have completely different uh, ideas of what success looks like. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. So for uh, just as we kind of round out the end of the episode here, I'd love to just ask you some kind of quick fire questions of um, just things that could help our audience specifically. And then I want to give uh, real quick before we do that, though, let's give the uh, audience an opportunity of where can they find you, where can they learn more information about this? Best thing for you to do, you can get the book for free. I know you already have it, but for everybody else, uh, they can get the book for free. Uh, Les and I have actually bought several thousand copies uh, and we're making them available. All you got to do is pay a couple bucks for shipping. Uh, so if you go to book.scalearchitects.com, uh, you will get access to just a ton of amazing information. So with the book comes about $350. Uh, dollars of just extra stuff that we've thrown in to make it as easy awesome. as possible to implement. So that's the best place to get started. If you're, uh, even if you're a coach or consultant, we've actually added a course in there for, specifically for coaches and consultants that they can use to learn more about the model and how it can serve them and their practice as well. So for everyone, that's really the best place to get started. A couple bucks and you get a book that added a million dollars to my bottom line. So 
uh, you can't get a, an ROI like that in most places. Uh, so it's a pretty cool deal. Um, so yeah, that's the best place to get started. Awesome. And then uh, what's your, you prefer Instagram, LinkedIn? How do you like people to connect? I am all over the place. LinkedIn's are, are, are uh, the platform where we're most active. We actually just got ranked one of the most active companies or the sixth most active company on LinkedIn uh, in our, our category. So that's wow. a place where you'll find a ton of free content. Uh, we post videos there all the time, content there all the time and um, use it. It's great. Very cool. You guys can uh, can find him on LinkedIn. It sounds like it's gonna be a great spot to do that. And uh, I want to take a second to remind you guys, please leave us a review um, so we can get more great people like this gentleman on the show. Um, you can leave us a review on Spotify now as well. I don't know if you saw that, that just popped up, but uh, uh, you can leave us a review on Spotify and uh, rank us on Apple Podcasts as well. Love to hear what you guys think of the episode. Make sure it's a five star um, if you do leave it. <laughs> so uh, let's let's kind of jump back in here for a second, kind of close it out. I'm going to ask you a few uh, Spitfire questions of just some things that I think can really just add value to the audience here. Still. So um, if you were to go back to your 20 year old self, and you know you're tripping over server wires inside of this house, you got HOAs knocking on your door every single day. What would you tell that young man? if you were to go back in time and talk to him. Enjoy it. I, and I think most of us are like this. We have a desire to get to the next stage, particularly mm -hmm. when we're in the challenging ones. And uh, I wish that I had enjoyed the simplicity of, and the insanity of those days more. <laughs> yeah. I can speak to that for sure. That's that, that definitely resonates. Other than Predictable Success, which is a phenomenal book, and I'm excited to read it, uh, what other books do you recommend people read? Man, there's so many good ones. Um, and specifically from an organizational reframing, re like kind of basically really trying to fix your organization if your organization has problems or, you know, you've, you've gotten past the fun stage where you're, um, you're running into some problems. What other good books to great. really helped you? Good to Great good is to a great. good one. Uh, I'm a big Patrick Lencioni fan. Uh, if you haven't started with him, two best places to start are either Five Dysfunctions of a Team or The Advantage. Those are great resources. They served us uh, relatively early on and really are a foundation for my view of leadership as a whole. Cool. I just, uh, it's the third time that someone has recommended that book to me. So I think that's a, I think that's a sign probably should, I think so. Up, but, um, or just re not even recommended to me, but just in general, like it just kept coming up and coming up. So I uh, appreciate that. And, uh, you know, when, when someone is kind of in this whitewater stage or they're really not sure where they are, obviously they can read the book, but, um, what were just some like things that really helped you get through the day to day? Cause I know that like this, this process wasn't an instant overnight success. You didn't immediately add that million. So what things did you do to kind of stick with it? Once somebody reads the book, they understand where they need to go. What were some things you did to kind of stick with it to, you know, hold out for that success? You know, quite honestly, uh, that wasn't a big challenge because we had been there for so long and we finally had hope that there was a way out uh, and, and we could feel the momentum pretty quickly. When you start doing the right things in the right order, uh, it, it's not about muscling through anymore, which is a really, really wonderful thing. I mean, it's a really challenging time. But uh, again, when you do the right things in the right order, and they're in the book, they're in the back of the book, we don't have time to go into them. But uh, what you'll find is that they create space to do the next thing. And so it's not like this accumulation of labor, right? You don't hustle your way through. It's actually the opposite. You're trimming away things. You're clarifying and cleaning things up. And, uh, you know, for some folks who, who jump into it prematurely, that would be harder. And it may even be a sign that you did it prematurely. But for those who are really in whitewater, when you start seeing the, end, the light at the end of that tunnel, you don't need to look anywhere else. Yeah, that's good. That's a good word, man. Very cool. Um, awesome. And uh, any parting pieces of advice for entrepreneurs that are either in the fun phase or, you know, either any of those phases of the book mentions, like what, what pieces of advice would you give them? Act your stage. So uh, I can't say there's one thing that works in every stage that, uh, that kind of goes against what I've learned as an entrepreneur. So, um, if you're in that, those early stages, do not buy into the every act, you know, everything what happens and this happened for us, but what happens for a lot of folks who are 
who are avid learners, right? Who love podcasts and consume content is they start to accumulate all these different strategies that, that are equally important, right? You got to have HR sorted and mission and vision and values and, and, oh yeah, don't forget to sell something. And you have to have systems and processes and we end up piling so many different responsibilities on us as leaders early on that it distracts us from the one thing that we actually need to do, which is to find that market and sell them something. And so if you're in, especially those early stages, uh, the book's helpful because it, it actually tells you what you don't have to pay attention to, which is the That's opposite good. of what you're going to hear just about everywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's super good. Great. Any other parting pieces of advice for uh, young entrepreneurs just getting started? I can go on and on. Second one uh, would be for folks that are just getting started is do not rush the process. Uh, one of, uh, a project I've been working on lately is called the Founders Evolution. And uh, what I've discovered is one of the things that causes entrepreneurship to be so difficult is that we rush the process. Uh, we, we start off in this stage that I call the dissatisfied employee. You're off doing something, you know, and it may be student, but just you, it's just marked by dissatisfaction. And what do we do when we're dissatisfied? Anything that we can do to satisfy, right? Like that's just the way that we're wired. But what you need to do in that early stage is to actually approach it like a trainee right? Approach it like someone who's sitting on the sidelines watching the game and use it as a learning opportunity. Because once you're in the game, it's sink or swim. Yeah. But if you, can, if you can get yourself close to the game, if you can find other people who are in the game and you can get in a position where you can learn from them, your time in that early struggle period will be a fraction of what it'll be if you go it alone too soon. That's good. Man, what a, what a great note to end on. Thank you, Scott. This has been awesome. My pleasure. It's a blast. Good deal. Guys, it's going to wrap it up for another episode of Spark to Fire. We really appreciate you guys, uh, your time and attention. And uh, if, you know, if you got some value out of this episode, which I know I got a ton of value and I'm going to go read that book like immediately, uh, leave us a review and uh, tell one friend. I'm going to challenge you guys to tell one friend about the show. Uh, because that's how the show grows. You know, we don't uh, spend a lot of time on advertising on this. We don't spend any money advertising and it grows organically because you guys love the show. Um, so I'm just going to challenge you guys to pay the fee, tell a friend, let a friend know that the show is awesome. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing more of those awesome reviews from you guys. So thank you and keep striking.